that this is the, the, the eve, in a sense, that this evening begins um, the first day of Shavuot. Pentecost, if you're not familiar, most everyone in here is familiar with that. Uh, and if you know, we've been in this period, uh, historically and biblically, of counting, the counting of the Omer. Probably Passover is long out of our memories, and if you were part of organizing it, maybe you've shut it out, oh, all the work, and it was Passover, and that's till next year. But really, everything is connected. The season that we're in is still connected to the Passover season. Right after Passover, the next was first fruits, and that's the, the beginning of the counting of the barley harvest, um, and then uh, it carried through for 50 days, hence Pentecost, uh, the seven Shabbatot, Shabbats, that, that then becomes uh, the celebration of the, the harvest of the fruit, um, the fruit being wheat, and I wish I could explain all the agriculture, but I don't know a fruit from, you know, why, why it's fruit and all that kind of stuff, but this is the idea that there was an in-between time, and we're thanking God for, for the provision, the, the harvest, and that's what, uh, what Shavuot is, a, is about. And um, honoring him by giving him the first portion of what he's given us, that's a good lesson for, for us at all, at all times. Traditionally in Judaism, uh, there's several things that are associated with, with the, the remembrance and the celebration of Shavuot. The most common one, as what Ariel mentioned, is that when you look at the dating, the time uh, in Passover, it was in the middle of the first month, and then you took 50 days later, you're into the third month, and that's the, that's the time of Shavuot, and when you look at Exodus uh, chapter 19, uh, in the beginning uh, of chapter 19, it says, in the third month after the, the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, that same day, so this is the same period of time. So the rabbi said, you know what, this is the time at Shavuot when the, the, the law was given, when the Torah was given. That's the primary um, observance that takes place in Judaism. There's also the reading of the book of Ruth at this time. And if you read the book of Ruth, you see it takes place in harvest time. There's that aspect of it that connects it with Shavuot, uh, as well as the idea that um, this idea of the foreigner being brought into the, into the nation. Because in Exodus, you see that as well. The people that left were, were the mixed multitude, Jews and non-Jews. And sort of fast forwarding a bit to the Acts chapter 2 portion that took place at Shavuot, as well, um, you see that wasn't just Jews there. It says Judeans and everyone that was in Jerusalem at that time, both Jews and proselytes, mentions all these kind of different people as well. It wasn't just the Jews that were there as well. So the reading of Ruth is something that takes place. And then there is, um, for next week, we might see some dairy products. Uh, dairy products are eaten at Shavuot. And you might ask why. Maybe you know all the reasons of why. But there's several. This, this is where it gets a little more sketchy as to why that might be. Um, there's different explanations as to why dairy is eaten at Shavuot time. Or, pen, pen, or yeah, Shavuot time. Uh, one would be the idea that this, you know, the promise of the land flowing with milk and honey. So they got the milk part there. Honey also is eaten. The word of God is sweeter than, than honey. And so kids will eat uh, cakes and things made out of honey um, that are shaped in the form of Hebrew letters. The idea that consuming the word of God is sweet. You look at Psalm 19, talks about that. Then it gets also even a little more tricky than that. Um, in the book of Numbers, there is a description of the sacrificial meal, where it just talks about the sacrificial meal that you're to eat to the Lord at Shavuot. And when you take the first letters of each of those Hebrew, four Hebrew words there, it spells from milk. Amazing, right? And uh, it gets into all kinds of other stuff. Mount Sinai, uh, the, is, is, it talks about the peaks, and the word for peaks is the, sort of similar to the word for cheese, and it goes on and on and on. And the Israelites were innocent as babes. They hadn't got the Torah yet, so, you know, they should eat milk products. And you can, that's only a few of the explanations, believe it or not. And I won't. basic kind of things that go on at Shavuot traditionally. And however, in Messianic communities, obviously, this is a big, a big one that was read today, Acts chapter 2. 
And for people who don't, you know, for, for non-Jewish people who aren't familiar with Shavuot, I kind of have fun with them sometimes when they come and say, well, this is Shavuot. Have you ever heard of Shavuot? Well, no, I haven't. But, but, they, but they probably have, of course, because, you know, she, I think you must have read from the, the TLV today, Grace, right? And uh, in your other translations, it says Pentecost, which is the word for 50. And so it's the same idea. And so we look at this as a time at Shavuot and this, that, that, uh, that this unique and unprecedented pouring out of the, of the Ruach HaKodesh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit, during the observance of Shavuot in Jerusalem. And typically, the interpretation that comes from this, when, when, when folks look at this Acts chapter 2 um, experience, or, or you know, scenario here, and I wrote down, I can just keep using this too, by the way, they, uh, I wrote down kind of a typical interpretation. This just came out of one of several commentaries I read. But this is kind of what you, the type of things you read that, when it discusses Acts chapter 2. It says that the Spirit's indwelling presence here is seen as God's replacement for the external guidance that the Mosaic law had provided believers under that old covenant. The Spirit's coming signals the essential, as Chaim would say, as the Spirit wasn't ever there before. But this is it's unprecedented. This is a very different coming of the Spirit for sure. But it says that the Spirit's coming signals the essential difference between the Jewish faith and commitment to Yeshua. For whereas the former, the Jewish faith, is Torah-centered and Torah-directed, the latter, which by the way is the Jewish faith, but anyway, the latter is Messiah-centered and Spirit-directed. So that's kind of the typical thought that this is this is the giving. This was the giving of the of the law, and this is the giving of the spirit. Very much different from each other. This is very, very much contrasted. And so I, I think, uh, however, and I'm sure a lot of you in here, I saw some nodding this way in here. Uh, I think that it's a little more contiguous than that. These two these two stories. And so with the time we have today, I want to look a bit at the two stories, some of the some of the details, and some of what I think are really the the major emphasis that are happening in both places. And so I want to look at those a bit. So I'm going to be flipping around. You can follow me if, if you can. Uh, I'll be in Acts 2 as well as, uh, well, we've read to Acts 2 and kind of looking at Exodus some. So first of all, just some of the basic stuff, and some of this may or may not be significant, but just showing that, that showing that these uh, the, the similarities between these two accounts. In Acts 2, we saw that they were all together in one place, right? Uh, which is exactly what happened uh, in, in the Exodus account as well. When you look at 19, all the, all the, the mixed multitude had come together, and they, they ch- as a matter of fact, what I'm going to do, do you want to read this? Yeah, let me read, let me read Exodus 19. Just going to give you the, the, this actually was read last week. This was part of Michael's message last week uh, from a different perspective. But I'm going to read, read the first several verses. This is, uh, ex- I mean, sorry, Exodus 19, verse 1. It says, In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, that same day, They arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They traveled from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and set up camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there right in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain, saying, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. So Moses went and called for the elders of the people and put, them, put to them all the words that Adonai had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, Everything that Adonai has spoken, we will do. Then Moses told Adonai that. So I'm going to stop right there. So again, we see a connection there's the group. The group is gathered in both places. Uh, then we also see in, in, in Acts chapter two, what was read today. You know, there's this noise from heaven and this light show. I call it a light show because it says there were tongues like fire. I mean, was it fire? The point is, there was some kind of light show that they saw visibly. And we see the same thing in the Exodus account. If I go further, we all know there's the, the loud thundering and the lightning and the sound, the pe- thing that scared the people and so forth at Sinai. So the same picture, kind of same picture goes on there. Then, in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, you see the, the, what's given the most press, the most uh, recognition often is the tongues and the, the speaking that's going on. And, uh, and I'm going to get back to this a little bit later as well, but it talks about that, what was being said. And it says that the mighty works of God are mentioned. 
Okay, the mighty, they're basically, what are these people talking? Not just that they heard them in their own language, they heard them saying, talking about the mighty works of God. People have tried to squeeze out exactly what is it, what was being said. It says the big acts of God, literally is what it says, the big great acts of God, things of God. Uh, and that's what's being talked about there. Um, in Exodus 19, uh, what I just read in verse 4, God did the same thing. Prior to him, him saying anything, he laid out for the nation of Israel all of the, the things that he had done, the mighty acts of God, same way. And uh, that was the foundation for his request to follow him. It wasn't so much about the law or anything like that, but just like in Acts, we see the same thing, that there's a, a foundation laid, these mighty, mighty works of God that are being spoken about in the tongues, and then followed by a request to follow which we'll get into a little bit later with Peter's sermon, um, based on God's track record. It wasn't so much about the tongues and the light show, and it wasn't so much about the law of what was being given. It was about, look what God has done. And it's about speaking about the things God has done. And this is the basis for the request to, to follow him. In Acts chapter 2, we see a lot of confusion with what's going on. We see amazement. It doesn't say there was fear, but I'm guessing there may have been a little bit of hesitation, little kind of nervous fear that was, you know, in this confusion and this amazement. We certainly see that in, in the Exodus account as well at the mountain. The people were so afraid. They said, Moses, you go, you talk, you, you talk to him or you tell him what we say. We don't want to talk to him directly. There's too much going on. We also see in Acts chapter 2 this idea, again, the, the testimony, the testimony to outsiders. <clears throat> I mentioned before, there were all kinds of people there. The tongues, again, were a testimony in a sense, but the testimony is what was being said, Right? The miracle of the tongues was only part of it. It was what the tongues were saying that was important, and that was the testimony to, again, the mighty deeds of God. And likewise, in the Exodus account, God says it too, but there was also a testimony to outsiders. We see that later on in the book of, uh, of Joshua, right, where we see um, when, when the spies go to Rahab and, and they, she's keeping them, and the, she says, look, we've heard. We've heard what God did for you guys. We, we've heard about it. The reputation precedes you. We know how God brought you out of Egypt. We know how you conquered your enemies and so forth. So there was a testimony, a known testimony in the happenings, just like the testimony that's happening in Acts chapter 2. God's words, again, were authenticated <clears throat> by the signs and wonders. And those signs and wonders were all really just proof of his existence, proof of his care. This is what I've done for you. Proof of his concern and his intervention to preserve and carry out his plans. Then, in Acts chapter 2, a little further down from what we read today, if you want to look at, look there. <clears throat> After this had all gone on, you realize the people, the people were confused. They're saying, oh, this is, this is, uh, what is this? Oh, I know what this is. They're drunk. This is crazy. I mean, everyone's got their theory about what's going on and trying to explain things away. <clears throat> and Peter says, no, this is what this is about. This is about prophecy that was given in the, in the past by Joel. And he says that, um, he says this, as Peter said to them, after all this explanation of what's going on, he, uh, more than the miraculous stuff, this is really the climax, I think, quite frankly, the end of chapter two. He says, repent, and let each of you be immersed in the name of Messiah Yeshua for the removal of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, for the, pro for the promise promise being the, the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as Adonai our God calls to himself. Now that's sort of the, that's, that's not even the very last part of Peter's sermon, but that's sort of the middle part. The first part you see in, in verse 36, and this is what I think really is his big idea. We talked about at seminary, where's, where's Garrett? Garrett's still here? Did he, like, he took off? Oh man, seminary student left. But uh, he, uh, he's going to see the video. Where, where was he? That's right. He only marked present if you're here for the whole time. You got to stay. So um, the, uh, the real big idea, they talk about the big idea of your sermon. What is the, the thing that you leave with somebody is in, found, I think, in verse 36. And Peter says that you know, all this stuff is happening. He says, therefore, let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, this Yeshua, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. I think that's his big message. That's his big idea of all this, the light show, the tongues, all this stuff is to get to the point of his, of his sermon, which is Yeshua is Messiah and Lord. Therefore, he says, repent and then be immersed, or in other words, identify with him by undergoing to Vila and receive the Holy Spirit. I think that's the big idea of this whole Acts 2 thing. As opposed to any other things you might, you might hear, you know, it's about you know, the Spirit versus the Torah, it's about the tongues. It's, no, it's, it's, it's this. This is the point. This is, what, this is how it concludes. 
And so the big idea, I think, is the same in the Exodus account. Exodus 19.5, I read it a second ago. It says, now then, after I told you all this stuff, okay, all the stuff that happened, i.e., kind of parallel to the light show in Acts 2, now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. In both cases, I believe, again, the message is basically the same. One that we should stop for a minute and take note of, of the message. And the message, again, is not about law versus spirit. It's about following God in both cases. And moreover, in both cases, the call to do that and the subsequent response in both cases, the, you know, everything you said we'll do. We know the Acts 2 response, you know, thousands were added to them at that time, right? In both cases, the call and the response to follow God comes before knowing all the details. In Exodus, the people had yet to receive the law when they said that. I don't know if you caught that when I was reading the beginning of Exodus. This was before even their big light show. It was just God saying, these are all the things I did. Now, if you're going to follow me, I haven't even told you what it's going to be yet. He said, that, that's what it, they didn't know it yet. They said yes. They said yes, all that you said will do. And in Acts, it's the same way too. These guys said, well, what's going on? What's going on? Here's what's going on. Now, if you will, now, confess and believe. He says the same thing. Yeshua is Messiah and Lord. Same thing. They, 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 um, they had yet to receive the Spirit, really, when they, had, when they uh, repented and received him through Peter's message. I think it's a very, very parallel situation. I, um, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think, I, uh, I was at my house. I was getting ready to, to leave. I walked down to the end of my driveway, that, and there was my mailbox. I was checking my mail, and a car pulled up, and the woman, woman rolled her window down. She had a little girl in her car, and she was in the driver's seat, and she looked over, and she said, excuse me, sir, will you do me a favor? And, uh, and I said, what probably a lot of you might say, I said, maybe. Because <laughs> I didn't know all the facts yet, did I? I didn't know what she's going to ask me. And that's often our attitude and our answer to God, I think. You know? And that could have been the answer here, you know? Everything I'm going to say you're going to do. Well, let me, let me, I know you're going to write it in a minute on these tablets, but I'd like to see it up front if I could. Could I see everything that's there? But no, that's often our attitude. And that's often our answer to God, I think. But that's not the call from God. I entitled the message today, I think, was Sinai, Shavuot, and the call of God. And that's not the call of God. The call of God is to follow without necessarily having all the facts first. And those are the two examples we see in these two accounts. So, is there a, a marked contrast between the giving of the law at Sinai and the outpouring of the Spirit at Shavuot in Jerusalem? A contrast that delineates a change in how we relate to God and how we are called by Him? I would say no. <clears throat> you know, I was going to say yes or no. I think I had yes or no in my notes. I took the yes out. I think it's no. Because I think biblically, I believe, both instances really are more the same. God calling his people to faith in him. Not that Sinai was all about, you know, works and the need to follow God by brute force and physical effort. And then the gift of the Spirit in Acts 2 was all about freedom in the Spirit and so forth. Um, effectively, you know, discounting all the things that God said prior in Scripture. I would say that the, the uh, if you remember that definition I gave you earlier about the, the Spirit's uh, being a replacement, I would say that the Spirit's indwelling pre presence is not a replacement for external guidance given by God, but it's a means of empowerment that is needed to follow God. Not a replacement, but an empowerment. And uh, if that's the case, I mean, do we, do we need that? Four of us need that and myself. That's great. Because, yeah, I don't know about you, but the, except for the four of you, but um, it's a constant battle, you know. Uh, every day I wake up and probably went to sleep thinking about the same stuff, you know, thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, thinking about all the stuff I have to do, think about my future, how I've got to line things up properly, formulating my plan for how it all gets done. But from Mount Sinai to, to Shavuot and Acts 2, uh, again, God's call is the same. And that is to trust in God and increase your dependence on Him and your faith in Him and diminish your faith in the world and your dependence on it. That's the message. In Acts 2, you know, the light show again gets so much press that I think we often miss, miss that whole punchline from Peter's sermon. Um, and and even, if, even in that, I think we miss a little sentence that Peter concludes with. And I want to look at those verses 38 and 39 again. And, if, and we're actually going to go to 40 as well. Because I think there's a little, little verse there that, that kind of really solidifies this, this idea. Um, and it is often overlooked. 
Again, verses 38 to 39 says, Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be immersed in the name of Messiah Yeshua for the removal of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far away, as many as Adonai our God calls to himself. Then in verse 40 it says, With many other words... Wouldn't you like to know what all those words were? I mean, there's more sermon. They, with, obviously, they're not germane or different than what, we've, what the words we do have. But it does say, with many other words, he, Peter, warned them and kept urging them, saying, save yourselves from this twisted generation. And fortunately, we, you know, we don't have to worry about that because we don't live in a twisted generation. And just like uh, back in Exodus 19, again, the people received the message at that point after, after he said that. It says, those who received his message were immersed, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. And again, just like in Exodus, the idea of, I've mentioned before is that that was prior to knowing all the ins and outs. That was just based on explaining what they saw, not even what they personally were indwelt with or anything. You know, prior verses in this chapter of Acts here bring thoughts of the tongues and the miracles, the recollection of God's great and mighty works, all of which are in great of great importance. I don't want to. I'm not. I'm not necessarily trying to minimize that. I'm trying to get at kind of the, what I think is more the the, the meat of the message. Because all that stuff prior, all of those those happenings that were, that were read about, pretty much the stuff that Grace read, um, were really a means to get to this conclusion: the need to follow God and not the world. That's what he ends with, with you know, saying this, with many. Other words, he warned them and kept urging them, save yourselves from this twisted generation. That was the thing he was trying to get to, to get to that conclusion. And really that's the same as the, again, the same as the conclusion that God was getting to at, at Sinai. Separating, keeping, getting his people separate. And making making uh, uh, something visible for, for the, the nations of the world to latch on to. That goes all the way back to Genesis 12, right? A testimony to the nations. The same thing, the same thing. The need to be empowered by him so that the process will repeat itself. So that people will continue to be impacted by God. Impressed by what he has done and what he can do. But only through people who have, you know, committed and continue to commit their lives to him. That's the same in both, both cases as well. What will your, uh, I want to ask you, you don't, don't have to answer. But think about, you know, what will your, your miracles be, personally? What will your mighty or your big works of God, like we're talked about uh, here in life, what will, what will your things be? The things that will be, you know, either you're going to talk about or, you know, or people are going to see in your actions in your lives. You know, what is it going to be in your life that's going to cause other people, like these people in Acts chapter 2, to be perplexed and amazed? <clears throat> things that will be so unbelievable to everybody that some will want to just write it off and simply chalk it up to you being drunk. And hopefully that won't be the case, right? And what's it going to be? And, and that's my goal. And I think it should be one of yours as well. Let me explain. I don't mean this to say you want to put you on a pedestal or anything like that. But I think the goal, it's a very worthwhile goal, for your life to be so off the charts in at least some area, whether it's your, your health, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your finances, whether it's your level of joy, <clears throat> whether it's your favor with people, whether it's your zeal and appreciation for life, no matter what stage of life you're at, you know, just something. Something that will be so amazing, so unbelievable that people are going to say, what's this all about? This, how is this possible? You must have a rich uncle or you must, I don't know, you must be on... Uh, Prozac or something, I, you know, what is it? And you'll know that, you know what, it's nothing short of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life by way of your faith in God and by way of your, your faith in the provision and the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua. It's got to be something. I pray that would be a goal of yours, to be so, again, so much of a, of a weirdo in that sense that people are going to wonder, how in the world, how can you be happy in this situation? How can you be happy in these circumstances? You know? All that kind of stuff. So I, I pray it'd be the same for you. That's the, that is the point of the whole experience at Shavuot in Jerusalem, this whole Acts 2 thing. Again, he makes that point in, in verses 38 and 39, the punchline of his sermon, and the punchline of my sermon today as well, that at Mount Sinai and 
at Shavuot in, in, in Acts 2 here that uh, it's all about, you know, the idea of repenting and letting each of you be immersed in the name of Yeshua the Messiah for the removal of your sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for you, the promise for you and your children. The, uh, there's several, I read several Hebrew versions of this, this, uh, this little message here, these two verses. And uh, don't get too worried. I mean, there's, there are no existing Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament. All the Hebrew manuscripts are, I mean, all the Hebrew Bibles are ultimately interpretations. But I believe they're interpretations by people who know the Greek language. Well, they've studied the context and everything of the Greek, trying to put it into the same idea in Hebrew. And there's a little more nuanced way that uh, that idea of of repent and let each of you be immersed uh, for the removal of your sins. It's a little more nuanced in Hebrew because Hebrew has a little different, a uh, couple different words for sins. But in the Hebrew versions I checked, it says to, to not just, re the, the word repent is translated into turn from your ways. That's what it says. Turn from your ways. Um, and then be immersed for the removal of your sins. And the, the, the one word for sin there is the one you may have heard Haim talk about. There's multiple words for sin. But this is the, the general, you know, you're shooting at this and you hit that kind of thing. You know, you, this, you, you miss the mark. You know, so turn from your ways and uh, receive, you know, your sins removed. And so again, that's the point. That's the point. The call to repentance and obedience for all. That's sort of the piece, I think, that sort of ties in with Ruth and, and so forth. But it started and ended with this same message at Sinai. That's kind of the way the, same, the message at Sinai went, went kind of the same way. And Peter ended his message with it at Jerusalem. And he was telling them to believe in Yeshua as both Lord and Messiah and to repent and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. That's what receives the, the big billing here in, in Acts 2. Three times, if you look at the end of this sermon for Peter, three times in these last verses he mentions the promise. If you look back at verse 33, he's, he's, when he's going through all these kind of things about saying, you know, this is what's happening. Uh, David spoke about it. I can tell you that David's certainly dead today. <laughs> he's not the one that was spoken about in the psalm here. He says in 32, he says, This Yeshua God raised up. We are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and receiving from the Father the promise, the Ruach HaKodesh. And then he goes on. And then if you look up in where we read in 38, he says it again. He says, Again, repent, be immersed in uh, the name of Yeshua the Messiah for the removal of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far away, as many as God has called to himself. So what was this? Because if we just you know, look at the Spirit and want to make this all about the Spirit versus law, you know, what, is the, what is the purpose of the gift? What's the purpose of the Spirit? Thanks for not shouting out. It's good. It's not polite anyways. Turn to John chapter 14, if you would please, if you'd like to, it's up to you. We'll have page turning or flipping, uh, finger flipping the police. So John chapter 14, in verse 15, that's where it talks about the, the, the helper that Yeshua is going to give them. This is where it talks about the Spirit. This is Yeshua speaking. He says, If you love me, <clears throat> you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so he may be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. I'm going to skip down to verse 26. The stuff in between of the guy saying, Well, show us the Father. Wait, what's going on? He says, um, He says, But the helper, the Ruach HaKodesh, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I said to you. So back to my question, what's the purpose of the gift? I think that's the, that's the purpose of the Spirit there. You know, that's the purpose of the promise. This is the promise that Peter is asking his audience to receive, to latch on to. And again, really what the message is, he's saying, look, do God's stuff. That's what Peter's saying here. Do God's stuff, not your own stuff. Follow him, not the world. Right? That's what he's saying. And he's saying, do this by the power of God, his very own spirit. That's what he's saying. So you can see, again, that things, I think, are a little more contiguous than we're often led to believe. That it's really one big circle, in a sense. I mean, yes, things get and have only gotten better. 
But foundationally, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. At Mount Sinai and Shavuot, we see the consistency of God's call, I think. So, when we think about Shavuot, this time of year, I think it's reasonable and it's useful to consider the, the historic marker of the time at Mount Sinai when God came to his chosen people, which where there was a mixed multitude as well of Jews and Gentiles calling them to trust and follow him. And I think it's also reasonable and useful to consider the historic marker of this time in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2, when God came to the Judeans and all who were staying in Jerusalem, both Jewish people and non-Jews, calling them to trust in him and his son Yeshua, to be redeemed from the curse of eternal separation from him, from God, and to receive the Spirit so that they can be empowered to continue to trust in him. They can continue to do the things he has wanted them to do all along. Not legalistic adherence to anything, but the point is there are standards he has, and he wants them to, to continue to follow him in those, by those standards, by his power. In both, both instances had less to do with knowing about the details and the religious ins and outs and all the other stuff, you know. And they had more to do with God connecting with, with humanity, with an eye towards them following, with an eye towards them loving, with an eye towards them obeying him. All because of and all based on his, his documented interaction, his presence with them and his provision throughout history. The same. You know, as we remember Shavuot today, I pray that it would be the same, same for you, that you would remember the former days when you encountered God for that first time, kind of like that Sinai time maybe. And maybe you redouble and rededicate your commitment to acknowledge all that he's done for you and all that he continues to do for you. And not the least of which is, the, is a promise of eternity with him and his people. Now I'm going to ask anyone here, you know, I don't want you to do this out of compulsion or peer pressure or anything, but you know, can, anyone, can anyone here raise their hand and attest to an encounter with God that has shaped you and brought you to where you are today? If you can, just raise your hand. You don't feel compelled to. And, and if you've not, if you've not encountered God and you've not made a commitment to him, you've not received the promise of his present and future presence, or maybe the memories have simply waned, I know you put your hands down, but put your hands up again, because I think we need them up again. So if, if you're the latter, I want to say, look at these hands. Keep the hands up. This is compulsion now that you put it up. But again, if, you, if you've let it wane, or maybe you, you, don't, you don't have that, that memory, I want you to, to look at these hands. Maybe these hands will be a testimony to you and a catalyst for you to overcome whatever it is that's been holding you back from trusting and believing in him and his son Yeshua as your ticket to life with him now and for eternity. So you can put your hands down now. During this season, as we consider the events at Mount Sinai and the events in Jerusalem in Acts 2 on the day of Shavuot, may we all remember God's works. May we all see the evidence of his presence in history, including our own lives. And may we answer his call to commit our lives to him. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our ability to gather together and to glean life. It's like we glean fields. We, we pray that we thank you for the ability we've had to glean life and goodness that you've pre preserved for us in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the example of Sinai as well as the example of, of the, uh, the Shavuot celebration in Acts 2. Both examples of your desire for us to remember that, you know, what you've done for humanity and how you desire for us to follow you. We also thank you, Lord, that you don't abandon us, you don't leave us to our own devices to do this, but that you've given us the Ruach HaKodesh, Lord, your very own power to live out lives in a way that honors you and follows you. I pray, Lord, that uh, if there's anyone here today that's not accepted Yeshua as both Messiah and Lord, and has therefore not received the power of your Spirit, Lord, that today would be the day that they would confess their need for Yeshua to come into their life, providing them with the, the needed atonement and power to obtain an eternal life with you and to live out this current life with you. It's in Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. So we're going to take a few moments here. We've got some time. If you'd like to come up and pray, there'll be uh, probably just a couple of us, I think, to pray maybe. Um, we have some folks out today, but we're going to do that. And... Uh, 
then we'll conclude our service.